And let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? And all the time. Find someone nearby this morning and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And you love me as much as I love you. Then nothing can break. I love into. Amen. Certainly it is just one more blessing from the great mighty God of heaven that he has enabled each and every single one of us to have this opportunity to assemble ourselves together the first Sunday of 2021. The Lord has blessed you. I know it was a few times maybe last year you didn't think you'd get to see the first Sunday in 2021. Amen. But you know what? Guess what? It wasn't because you passed all of the tests of 2020. It wasn't, it wasn't because you made all the marks that you were supposed to make. But it's all because of God's grace and God's mercy that he has blessed us to be here on this morning. Thank God for his grace. God giving us those things that we do not deserve. Thank God for his mercy. Him keeping from us those things that we do deserve. If God treated us the way that we should be treated... There wouldn't be nobody in this building on this morning. But we ought to be grateful that God is long-suffering and that he is patient with us. I'm glad he's not a short-tempered God because guess what? We'd have burned the fuse a long time ago. But guess what? He's the God of many chances. He's the God of another chance as long as you come back to him with a pure heart. I'm so glad to be here on this morning. We want to thank all of you that have tuned in watching us via live stream on this morning. Thank you in this age of cyber worship you could have tuned in anywhere you wanted to this morning but we're grateful that you stopped by to attend here with us on this morning um, we pray that you will listen to the word of God and pray for there'll be something that will benefit you in your day-to-day -day walk um, with the Lord Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning yeah. amen I believe you came to the right place go with me if you will to the gospel of John the gospel of John chapter number eight and we're going to begin at verse number one, and we're going to read down to verse number 11. As I grow as a student in the Word of God, one of the things that I'm finding that is so amazing is that you can look at one text and get so many messages from just, from just one text. And I think, uh, I think we discount ourselves a lot of times when we approach the Word of God because we already have in our mind, okay, I've heard this before, I've seen this before, I already know how it's going to play out. So you already come to the text with your preconceived ideologies and what you think is going to be. But we have to get to a place in our life where we don't try to dictate to the text what it ought to mean. But we ought to let the word of God speak to us as to what the word of God has to say. So I, I pray that you all will be, um, go with me this morning to the Gospel of John chapter 8 um, and pray with me because this year I'm striving to do something. I'm trying to be more, what you'll say, expository in my lessons, meaning I ain't, I, I ain't got no notes up here with me. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see what God's going to do. John chapter 8, John chapter 8, we're going to begin at verse number 1 and go to verse number 11. The grass wither and the flower thereof shall fade away, but the word of God shall stand forever. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center, saying, Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. And when they persisted in questioning him, he stooped down and said to him, the one that is without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing in the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one accused you? No one, Lord, she said. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go and from now on, sin no more. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. I want to give for our message on this morning, get out of the crowd. Get out of the crowd. They said that they caught her in the act of adultery. And, and though I, I know where most of us in here, you are adults, you're grown, you've gotten to a point to where you can understand what this is and what it looks like. But I, I wonder, how did all of these people catch her in the act? They emphasize that it's not just what we heard about it, but she was caught in the very act of adultery. And by the time... They bring her to Jesus. A whole crowd of people have interrupted Jesus' service to break in and say, hey, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. We did. We, we caught her in the very act of adultery. Now, what are you going to do about it? Now, most of the time, we focus on the woman. And there's a lot to be said about the woman because my second question is, come on down with me, brothers. Come on down with me. Where is the man? Because if you go back to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 10, it says that if a man and a woman be caught in the act of adultery, that you're not just to bring the woman caught in the act, but you are to bring the woman and the man both caught in the act of adultery, and they are both to pay the price for the sin that they have committed. Ain't it funny how when people get caught up in sin that one always want to throw the weight on the, the other individual? Where is the man? If, if, if we're going to be just, if we are going to come to a point to where we are really going to execute justice, why is it that we have a standard for the woman and then we have another standard for the man? I, I'm, I'm not going to get in that. That'll take us to a whole other place. But the misogynic way in which we handle genders is interesting here. Because she was caught in the act, the brother was released. But the woman is held to another standard. Isn't it hard to be held to a different standard than other people? Isn't it hard to be held to another standard? Isn't it kind of unfair when two people do the same thing, but one person gets handled differently than the other person gets handled? We can see the sin when it's Pookie or Ray Ray, but when it's your son or your daughter or your, your husband or your wife, we don't see the same sin as we see it when it's with somebody else. That's what scares me about people. I would rather fall into the hands of God than to fall into the hands of men because at least God have mercy. But you know how people are once people have their minds set up about you, once they have come to a conclusion about you, it's very rarely that you will get that individual to change their mind. Once they have decided on something, if they, don't, if they say they don't like you, and then you're going to do, you can bring them all the pies that you want to bring, you can cook all the cakes that you want to cook, they're not going to like you. If they don't want nothing to do with you, they're not going to have anything to do with you. So whoever caught her in the act and snatched to all of that all of a sudden we got a crowd that's building and all of a sudden people that didn't even know anything about the situation have everything to say about the situation and isn't it funny if we're not careful sometimes if we're not careful and we don't watch ourselves we'll find ourselves joining the crowd and stuff that we don't even know about we'll find ourselves speaking about it Situation that ain't got nothing to do with us, we'll find ourselves spearheading the situation because we have gotten into the crowd. And I wondered when I was looking at this text, is there anybody here that know what it's like to be attacked by a crowd? I, I'm not talking about one little devil that you got to fight. You remember when there was a man that was possessed with demonic spirits? And he came to him and he asked him his name. He said, we are legions. We and me are many. It ain't just one of us in here. It's, it's many of us that are up in here. We, it, it's, it is often time in life, you're not just fighting one fight. 
but you're fighting many fights at one time. Yes. So we're being attacked by a crowd. You got people attacking you. You don't even know why people are attacking you. You just look around and you got a whole gang of people that are ready to fight and they don't even have all of the facts. See, the hard thing about being a Christian sometimes and really caring something about your integrity and who you are is that you realize oftentimes you got to let the crowd speak and you got to be quiet. Because if you speak, you will give out information that you should not be giving out. So sometimes you got to care enough about your integrity. It don't do you no good to win the argument and lose your integrity. It don't do you no good to win the fight and you lose your integrity. At the end of the day, you always want to maintain your integrity. Now, where the crowd makes their mistake is that they bring her to Jesus. Now, 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 they wanted a better chance of having this woman killed by the sin that they are accusing her of. They should have killed her when they had the chance. But now you are bringing her to Jesus. And my Bible tells me that there is therefore now no what? Condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But, but they are here and they're bringing her here. They brought her to Jesus. They should have got her when they had the chance, but they got together. You got the scribes and you got the Pharisees. They've all gotten together and they brought her to Jesus. Now somebody say, bring me to Jesus. Bring me to Jesus. Don't bring me to church. Bring me to Jesus. And I'm concerned because there are many people in, li in life today that really don't know the difference between the church and Jesus. They think that conversion is just coming to church. They think they come to church. A lot of people, they come to church, but they've never had the opportunity to come to Jesus. So, that, so they never really truly have a relationship with Jesus. They're just having an occasional experience. They got, they got visitation rights with the master, but they never really had an encounter with Jesus. This woman is laying out, clothes ripped, this woman is laying out and being judged by all of these people, she knows what the consequence is for what they have accused her of. She is not blind to the fact that she could at any moment be stoned to death by what they have accused her. And I'm not just talking about somebody throwing pebbles at you. I'm talking about people picking up boulders, people picking up rocks, and them continuously throwing them at you, hitting you all upside your head until you are unconscious, and then they don't stop throwing the rocks until you are completely covered by the rocks and are not being able to see by the human eye. Mercy, mercy, mercy. What if we got stoned today for some of the stuff that we've... Imagine being stoned. Imagine people throwing stones at you, lacerating your skin, lacerating your flesh, and blood continuing to come down until you are out of it. Rumors are rocks. I said rumors are rocks. And, and if people continue to throw them, and if you throw them enough at people, after a while, you can't see the people because of the rumors. You, you can't see the individual because of what has been said by that individual. And listen, every time you repeat the rumor, you become a part of the crowd. Every time you retweet it, every time you repost it, every time you share it, you become a part of the crowd. They brought her, they brought her to Jesus because the law condemned her to be stoned. And if Jesus says no, then he is not respecting the law. And we are still at this time under the Mosaic law. A and we can't be under grace because the New Testament cannot be enforced until what? The testator dies. And the testator is not dead, so we are not here under the new covenant. So once again, the enemy is trying to trap God, using God against himself. And if, if, if I wish I had to show you that this is not a new trick. 
This is not something that the devil is trying for the first time. Because if you go way back to the Garden of Eden, where Satan gets Eve to partake of the fruit and then give it to Adam, and now what God hates and what God loves has become fused together. Yeah. They have become fused together. And, and, and when they brought her to Jesus and, and they brought her there and said, what sayest thou? Now, now, what's so cool about Jesus is that he didn't say nothing. He didn't say nothing. Instead, he stooped down and began writing in the ground. He stooped down and he began writing in the dirt. Now, the power of the text it's not in the words of the text, but it's in the silence of Jesus. It is in his refusal to become a part of the game that they were playing. It is his courage to be different. It is his ability to be an individual that will not succumb to the request of the crowd. It is his ability to stand apart from the rest and dare to be different even in the face of criticism. Yeah. It is his silence that screams the loudest at me. And sometimes the best thing you can say to your enemy is nothing. The best thing you can say to your enemy is nothing. His silence speaks to me, but his stooping down speaks even more to me. Because... His silence is powerful, but his stooping down is even more powerful because I don't know about y'all, but I need a God that can stoop down. Yeah. 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 I need a God. I need a God that is not dependent upon me coming to where he is, but I need a God that is able to stoop down. His stooping down says to us how far God is willing to go to get you out of the predicaments of this life. No matter how far out you have gotten, no matter how deep you have gotten in your mess, God says, I am a God that will stoop down, come exactly to where you are, pick you up, turn you around, place your feet on solid ground. Thank you for being the kind of God that'll get your hands dirty. Yeah. Surrounded by all these holy people. Oh, yeah. Surrounded by all these people that felt as if they could pass judgment on somebody that doing the same thing they've been doing. She just got caught. <laughs> but, 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 but Jesus, he does not jump on the bag. Right? He's not like us. Because, you know, when we see the majority against one, we join the majority. Because we don't, we don't want to be ousted. We don't want to look like an outsider. But Jesus doesn't care about all of that. Jesus just begins to write on the ground. He begins to, he begins to write. He, their God, their God in the flesh is getting his hands dirty. All of these righteous people standing around. And Jesus has gotten his hands in the dirt. That's how I became a child of God. That's how my soul got saved. Because Jesus stooped down and he rescued me. He stooped down and he picked me up. He stooped down and he changed my situation. He stooped down. He stooped from eternity into time. He stooped from the celestial to the terrestrial. He stooped from the angels to be born in a manger. He stepped down from his omniscience and his omnipresence. He stepped down to be wrapped into a clay body. God stepped down to rescue us. He stoops down into the gospel story. That's why everybody who's ever been in adultery, everybody that's ever been in sin, everybody that's ever gotten high, everybody that's ever gotten drunk, everybody that's done any kind of incident, that's why you ought to be thanking God. That's why you ought to be thanking God. Because no matter how far out you got, no matter how deep in the mud you got, he was able to reach down and pick you up out of your situation. So Jesus, so Jesus, Jesus, he didn't break the law. He didn't tell them that the law wasn't good. He didn't say that the law wasn't right. 
He didn't say that the law was abolished or that the law was over. He just added an addendum to the law, if you will. And he said, go ahead. He that's without fault, throw the first stone. That's an important thing here. Because if you stop the first one, you'll stop the rest of it. So he put the stipulation on the first one. He that is without fault among you, let him cast the first stone. And if you can't get the first one, you can't get the second one. He didn't, he didn't put a stipulation on the second, on the third. It's on the first. So if you stop it at the first, you won't have to deal with the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. If you stop it while you got a chair, you ain't got to worry about the rest of it. He that's without fault among you, let him cast the first stone. And this is where it gets good. This is where it really gets good. Because there, there are four points that I, I want to give right here. And that, that is one, once they had convicted her without a trial and brought her up under condemnation. But they brought the condemned woman to Jesus. That I've already said in whom there is no condemnation. So, so they're bringing condemnation to no condemnation. I said they're bringing condemnation to no condemnation. He didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. They came to condemn. They came to kill. They came to steal. They came to destroy. That's what they came to do. But they came that you might have when Jesus stood up and he said, he that's without fault among you. Let him cast the first stone. And he didn't even wait. He didn't even give them time to respond. He stooped again because once you plant the seed, you got to let the seed work. I said once you plant the seed, you got to give the seed time to work. And the Bible says the next two words I'm going to use here, they, 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 they were convicted. They were convicted while he was writing. I wish I could know what Jesus was writing on the ground. He probably wrote the, the joker's name that was called up in it, and he probably saw his name. Man, I'll see y'all later, man. They, they were convicted. They were convicted as he wrote, as he began to write in the ground. The, the difference between intelligence and ignorance, church, is thinking. The difference between ignorance and intelligence is simple thinking. The one thing the crowd will never want you to do is think. They want you to follow. But they don't want you to think. They want you to imitate them, but they don't want you to think. They don't want you to think. They want you to obey, but they don't want you to think. They don't want you to think. And Jesus gave them time to think. He that is without fault among you. Let him cast the first stone. And then they started remembering. Because apparently they had forgotten some stuff. As they were bringing this woman to Jesus. They, they start remembering. See, see, that's what I meant when, when the scripture says, beginning at the oldest. That's what it means. And, and, and you can understand that young men being, being hurt because they, 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 have, they haven't lived long enough to see failure, not to be critical and judgmental. You think you know everything, but ain't no way you're going to get gray-headed and not make mistakes. Ain't no way you're going to get gray-headed and not do some foolish thing. Ain't no way you're going to get gray-headed and not repeat some of the same foolish things over and over and over again. Child of God, I would venture to say that the only reason that you are able to get gray-headed is that you have made mistakes, is that you have been through the trial, is that you have fought the battle, but the battle did not destroy you. You took that licking and you kept on ticking and you trusted in God and he sustained you. Somebody over 50 need to make some noise up in here. I mean, you didn't make it to this age without doing something stupid. Somebody said, preacher, I ain't got over the hill yet. I ain't got over the hill yet, you know. Now you're going to fall out in the floor 
Now when somebody gets caught in the act, we want to fall out in the floor and act as if we've never done anything. Even though you may have never did nothing like that, you still did something. And, and, and the next time, before you so quick to join the crowd, before you so quick to open your mouth and speak on a situation that you don't know anything about, just think about if after you do that, God just decided to open your closet door. Just, just think about if God decides to pull the veil off of your life. Everybody think you holy and say, child, they're going to be looking at you cross-eyed, going to be looking at you sideways. But if we just be real about it, if we had the opportunity to really know each other, we wouldn't fool with each other like that. Because too often, I don't like you because I see me in you. But the bad thing about that is we find it easy to condemn them. But we can't condemn ourselves. So, 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 so. Everybody got a crowd. Rich people got crowds. Poor people got crowds. Preachers got crowds. Doctors got crowds. Lord God, everybody got a crowd. And as I said earlier, you remember... When, 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 when the demons got into those pigs yes, and they drove those pigs crazy, they ran off the side of the mountain, they, they drive themselves. And the Bible says that the herd ran into the water and drowned. Following the crowd to get you into some trouble. What your mama told you was a child, if, if they jump off the bridge, you're going to jump out with them? <laughs> if they do this, you're going to do that with them? Following the crowd will get you into some situations that you don't want to be into. Following the crowd will end your life before time. Come on now. Follow, following the crowd, and I, and I want to speak that to, to those of you that, that are young in the room. Don't, don't follow the crowd. Don't, don't try to be like everybody else. Be your own individual. Be who God has called you to be. You ain't got to try and be like nobody else. You ain't got to try and dress like nobody else. You ain't got to try to have what nobody else has. Everybody else is already occupied. You might as well take time and be who God has called you to be. And God will bless you as an individual. But I know, I know it's easy because peer pressure is something else. And can I say, not just young people deal with peer pressure, older people deal with peer pressure as well. It's just on a different level than it was. But I want to encourage you, church, be who God has called you to be. Don't be a person that wants to attach yourself to the crowd. That, that wants to attach yourself to somebody else's agenda and what somebody else is trying to do. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God will bless you and all these other things will be added unto you. So Jesus, so Jesus speaks to them and he says, Jesus says to them, he that is without fault among you, let him cast the first stone. And he stooped down and he went to writing in the ground. And he left them to do something that I'm challenging you to do in this room this morning. Think for yourself. And they said that they were convicted. They were convicted. That's a word that has left the church. It's conviction. That it's pretty much gone. We, you know, it's pretty much gone right now. We, we think that conviction fell, you know, when, when, when we're having a gospel meeting or we're having a revival or we want somebody to come through that's going to preach the paint off the wall. We want people to come that's going to sing and lift up our spirit. I don't care if Jesus come and preach. If you ain't got no conviction in your heart, there's not going to be any change that's going to take place. Your life is not going to be any different. Things are not going to be made better. Somebody can stand up here and preach today. Tall fall out their mouth. If you don't have any conviction, there's not going to be a change in your life. 
conviction starts transformation. As long as you have conviction, you will have the opportunity to transform. Now the problem becomes when you get to a place in your life where you're no longer convicted. You, you're in a bad place where you get to a place that's what they call a high-handed pretentious sinner. There's somebody, there's somebody that get, gets in such a rut to where, man, I, I, I ain't going to see no wrong in what I'm doing, man. I'm all right. I'm doing just fine. I'm doing good. You're in a bad place. You're in a bad place when you start thinking like that. Con, and, con, everybody else can be sick of you. Everybody else can be tired of you. Every, oh my God! Everybody, everybody can tell you. Everybody can tell you how tired they are of you. Everybody can tell you how sick they are of you and how much they want to change. But until you get sick of yourself, until you get tired of yourself, until you get sick of the things that you are doing yourself, people can talk all day long. You're not gonna make a change until you get tired. For yourself. Wait, I, I, so they're convicted. They're convicted not by what is being said. They're convicted by their own conscience. They've convicted themselves. This wasn't even a conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were convicted of their own accord. I, I think I'm wrong. I've made a mistake. Stoning her, I deserve the same penalty that she's getting. And I think it would help us to become more humble individuals. When you realize you really ain't got no room to talk about Sue, to talk about Jane, to talk about Tom, to talk about Bob, because you're just as messed up as they are. You just do a better job than putting your makeup on. You see, she might get stoned, but it won't be my rock. Amen. They might get stoned, but it won't be a rock that's thrown by me. It won't be my rock because I am conscious of my fallibility. Amen. I'm conscious of that. I'm conscious of my humanity. I'm conscious of my, uh, I'm conscious, and, and, and isn't that what being spiritual is all about? Yes. Didn't, didn't the Bible say if a brother be overtaken in a fault. Ye which are what? Spiritual. Restore such a one in the what? Spirit of meekness. In the spirit of meekness, what? Considering your own self. So every time you get ready to say something about somebody, you got to be conscious about yourself. If you are conscious of yourself, Self will make you shut up. Self will make you be quiet. Self will make you walk away. Self will get you to a point to where somebody can walk up to you talking about junk and you say, you know what, I ain't got time for it today. You know what, I ain't even got time, man. I'm trying to have some peace. I'm trying to have some tranquility in my life. And you know, that ain't nothing but the devil bringing you garbage, trying to get it into your mind and get it into your heart because he doesn't want you to focus on the things of God. You got to be conscious of who you are. The Bible says that all of your righteousness in the eyesight of God a number of filthy rags. All, All of our righteousness. A number of filthy rags. So who as a pot can tell the kettle they're too black? <laughs> Self will make you apologize. Self will make you give people another chance. Self will make you cry out to God for mercy. Consider yourselves some of us will find that we've been caught up in the same situations in the same predicaments so no room do you have to cast judgment if anything you ought to be trying to help the individual I never met so, so, so many people that I find that instead of trying to help the drowning man we pour water on the drowning man 
Instead of trying to be some assistance to the one that is falling, to the one that is drowning, we want to kick a man while he's down. But let you be the one that's trying to, oh, help, help me, please, somebody. Look out. We want people to be there for us. We want people to have mercy on us. We want people to give grace towards us. But then when the shoe is on the other foot, we don't want to do the same thing. There were two people that owed money. You know the story. There were two that owed money. And, and the woman, she only owed a little bit, a, a, a small amount to the man, but he was just so hard pressed over what she owed him. But he owed an even greater debt. And I wonder how many of us could really realize how much of a debt you owe to God. Think of how much in debt we are to Him just by the new mercies that we see every morning. Think, think of the debt that we owe to Him in the sacrifice of him giving his life yeah. as a perpetuation for our sins that you would not have to pay the penalty of death but that you could have life and not just life but life everlasting yeah. if you would be faithful unto him he paid a debt you heard me say he paid a debt he did not owe because you owed a debt that you could not pay that's love that's love that's love and self self will make you get yourself right and Jesus, Jesus, he's, he's back down, he's back down here in the dirt again. And one by one, they're dropping their rocks. <laughs> one by one. They see, the, see one walking off, man, I might as well throw mine in too, man. Yeah, man, yeah. if Tom couldn't cast the throne, man, I know, <laughs> I know I can't cast now, man. Yeah, if Ch man, Charles to walk off, man, I know I ought to leave behind. One by one, they began dropping their rocks. I don't know who it is this morning, but somebody got some rocks they need to drop. I don't know who it is, but somebody got some stones that they need to put down. Some of us are already locked and loaded, just ready, just ready, man. I'm just waiting on you to say something about me. I'm just waiting on you not to speak to me. I'm just waiting on you to step on my toe on accident. I'm just waiting on you. Man, you looking for the usher, but I thought you was looking at me sideways. I thought you were looking at me. I'm just waiting on that opportunity. Man, I'm going to reach all the way back to the ancestors. You got some stuff. You need to let go. You got some stuff you need to get rid of. Let he that is without sin cast the first stone. No, 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 no. No, I feel, I feel justified. I, I, I know they were wrong. I know they betrayed you. I know they never paid you back. I know they said stuff. I know they betrayed your trust. I know they did you low down and dirty, but drop your rock. People telling me to get over it. They don't know how much it hurt. Drop your rock. She was my best friend. We used to travel together. We used to do this. We used to do that. Man, I didn't know all the time. She went, drop your rock. Because it's her today. It could be you tomorrow. It, it's me. It's me today being put out here. But tomorrow, it could be you. Let he that is without sin cast the first stone. And then let us stop being preferential in our judgment. If you're going to bring the woman, bring the man. If you're going to bring the man, bring the woman. It takes two to tango. Come on now. If you're going to bring part of it, bring all of it. But you want the reason we don't bring all of it is if we bring all of it, we're including ourselves. And you know what? I condemn you all day long, but I ain't going to talk about myself. Get out of the crowd. You know, it was so easy for everybody to come. Oh, y'all finna stall somebody? Man, I've been waiting. I got some rocks. Man, I've been, I, I been, I been waiting for somebody to do something. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Where she at? What? Where she at? What? Oh, I got a basket of rocks. 
I got stuff I've been putting, I've been hiding away. I've been putting it up. I've been balling it up. I've been keeping it on the inside. Sue talked about me. I got a rock. John did me wrong. I got a rock. Somebody out of my job, I heard they was talking about me. I got a rock. And everything that happens, we storing it away. So now, it may be somebody that ain't even trying to do you no wrong. But because you already got so much stuff built on the inside of it. I'm making you pay the price for something that you ain't even done. For something that ain't even got nothing to do with you. Drop your rock. Yes, sir. That's it. Drop your rock. Drop your rock. You, you, you'll quickly drop your rock if you just take time to look in the mirror. Take time to look in the mirror and realize, you know what? It was only because God shielded me that I was not in this situation. So because God was merciful to me, why not I'd extend mercy to somebody else? Because God was gracious to me, why not I extend some grace to somebody else? Get off the bandwagon. Don't be like everybody else. Just because everybody else wants to be the judge, jury, and the executioner, you realize, guess what? One day you got to stand before a judge yourself. One day you got to give an account yourself. You ain't got time to be trying to play judge for nobody else. Get out of the crowd. I really wish, my brother, I could have been there to see what Jesus wrote on the ground. I really wish, I really wish I could, I, I could have been there. Because apparently whatever he wrote, it got them in place. Whatever he wrote, man, as they began to look at it, they just had to say, you know what, man, ain't nothing I can do. I, I, got, I got to leave it alone. Because he knows you. He know, every single one of them that were there, Jesus knew them. He knew what they had been, where they had come from, what they were involved in. So uh, Jesus literally probably, in so many words, literally we have a mirror on the ground. And these men are looking at it. And the same sin, the same wrongdoing that they see in the woman, they now see it in themselves. So if I'm condemning her, I'm condemning myself. So let he that is without sin cast the first stone. And you see there was nobody that was able to throw a stone. Say after a while, I said, wasn't nobody but her and Jesus. Jesus, Jesus looked at her and said, woman, where your accusers at? Where was all, where was all the men? Where was all? And, and the question is always asked, where was the other man? If you ask me, he was in the crowd. Because a good way to keep me covered is to kill you. A good way to keep me covered, a good way to keep me protected is to take you out of the game so you can't talk. It's to discredit you so people don't believe, man, this is good stuff. So people will discredit you so they won't believe anything else that you got to say. That's why I got to go around and tell them you did this. Tell them you said that. Tell them you was involved in this. So when you do come and try to turn state's evidence, they ain't going to listen to anything that you got to say because I already tore up your reputation and your name. Slander. Get out of it, church. We as children of God, we ought not even be in the crowd. Amen. You're supposed to be following Jesus. Yeah. What did he tell you? He told we got to what? Deny ourselves. Yeah. And then after we've denied ourselves, he tells us to take up our cross and follow him. That's a daily event. That's a daily occurrence. And in, in closing, that was a woman. Um, she had came to the preacher um, after the service one Sunday. She said, preacher, I'm leaving this church. She said, I'm just sick of it. Brother and sister so-and-so doing this. They, they involved in this, they and that. I just can't be around this. I'm going to go somewhere else. And the preacher was like, okay, sister, you know what? I'm not going to stop you from going. He said, but before you leave, I want you to do something for me. And he got a glass of water, and he filled it up to the top. And he said, I want you to take this glass of water, and I want you to walk around the whole building and come back 
but I don't want you to drop a single drop of water out of the cup. And she said, okay, so she went and she did it, and it came back. And uh, when she came back, he asked, he said, well, what was so-and-so doing? She said, I don't know. He said, what was so-and-so involved in? He said, I don't know. He said, why couldn't you notice what they were doing? Because I was, I was focused on keeping the water in the cup. When you're focused on what God has given you, when your mind is fixed on what you are supposed to be doing for God, you ain't got time to worry about what's going on over here. You ain't got time to worry about what's going on over there because I got to keep myself focused. I got to protect what God has given me. I got to complete the assignment that God has given me because me looking at you ain't going to benefit me. Me knowing where you at and where you involved in is not going to benefit my soul's salvation. Not going to help me one bit. I got to look at me. I got to worry about me. I got to change. You can't change nobody else. Change you. That's it. Work on yourself. What do William brother say? Sweep around. We got enough that we have to worry about to be trying to get with the crowd. And Jesus tells us something. Jesus said, you know what? He said, said, where are your accusers? She said, said, there's no one left. He said, well, no one has condemned you, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, after God has delivered you from a situation, he delivers you with the intent that you don't go back to the situation. But you know us. We schizophrenic from time to time, you know. We, 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 you know, we, you know, same thing over and over again. Find ourselves in the same situation, same old rut, same old puddles. Every time we turn around, back in it again, back in it again. Jesus said, you know what? They couldn't condemn you, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So after you've gotten out of it, the intent is to never go back to it. But we know as human beings, life always brings us back. And you know, they ain't nothing but the devil. Because he know you just got out of a situation. So what he got to do is as you're trying to get past the situation, he got to take that situation and increase it, put it on down the road just a little bit further. That's why you feel like sometimes you're just getting out of one thing and going through another, getting out of one thing and going through another. I got over this hill and I got to climb up this mountain, got through this valley, now I got to go through this because the devil said, you know what, man, I I didn't get you last time. Here I come again. I, I, I couldn't take you out the last time. This time I'm going to put a bow on top of it. Send it in a, send it in a gift box. So he's going to come in all shapes, all forms, all fashions that he can. But Jesus has told you to go and sin no more. Leave it alone. Leave it behind you. You can't get to where God wants you to be walking with stone. Imagine how hard it would be for you to swim across a lake with rocks in your pocket. Um, Imagine, imagine how hard it would be for a ship to get to its destination loaded down with rocks, loaded down with boulders. You got to get that stuff off of you. We going into a new year, you ought to want to have all that stuff off you. All, All that work, all that stuff that you worried about last year, you ought to left it in last year. All that stuff that you stressed about last year, you ought to left it in last year. All that stuff that kept you up worrying and crying and stuff, you ought to left that stuff in last year. And determine in your mind, as the Bible said, God can do a new thing in your life, church. He can do a new thing, but you got to allow him to be. What I love about God, he ain't going to stick you up. He ain't going to make you do nothing. You got to come on your own accord. Jesus could come and just knock the rocks out of your hand. He could do that. He wants you to come to a place to where you yourself drop them. He wants 
there to be conviction on your part. He wants you to get to a place to where you say, well, you know what, man, you know what? I know me. God knows me. So if he can still love me in spite of me, I got to throw away these stones. I got to put them away. And when I see a brother or a sister in a fault, I'm going to be the one that's there to help them. I'm going to be the one that's there to assist them with what it is that they're going through because it's them today. Yes, sir. Maybe me tomorrow. That's it. That's it. He that is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. Get out of the crowd. Get out of the press. Stop trying to run along to get along. Be who God has called you to be. Be your own individual. Think for yourself. Don't let nobody think for you. You think for yourself. You smart. You smart individual. What the, what the lady told on, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, what was that movie? Uh, the Help. You is smart. You is special. If ain't nobody told you, you is smart. You is special. If ain't nobody told you that, you is. You is. You is. Think for yourself. Be who God has called you to be. God will bless you. You, can, you can't make it to your destination looking behind you. but trying to drive forward. You're going to hit something. You're going to run into something. Keep your mind focused on God. That, that's the key. Keep your mind focused. Keep your mind stayed on him. And always remember who you are, where God found you. And as long as you remember that, you will never be a one to pick up a rock. Because I don't want nobody throwing rocks at me. My brother and my sister, Jesus came to do away with our condemnation. He came because he saw that we as humankind were in a bad state. He came because he saw the sins that we had gotten ourselves into and he knew that there was only one that had the power to bring us back from that sinful state that we had gotten into. Look throughout the earth. There was not one that was found who was worthy to do what he came to do. So he himself, he came down, was born of a woman, lived among us. He did no wrong. There was no guile found in his mouth. He was not guilty of sedition or heresy. He was only guilty of opening blinded eyes. He was only guilty of healing those who had been bruised and brokenhearted. But still, when they were given the opportunity to choose between him and a notorious murderer by the name of Barabbas, they said, kill Jesus and give us Barabbas. He's led from judgment hall to judgment hall. Pilate said, you know what? I cannot find no fault in this brain. Bring me some water and let me wash my hand. They, they beaten him all night long. I mean whips going down his back. Great drops of blood. He is now pouring out. He has to carry a cross up Calvary. Calvary's hill. The hill, they say, was Golgotha's hill shaped like a skull, what they call the place of the dead. And he gets up there, and they stretching him out on the cross. Somebody bring me a nail. They put nails in his hands. And, there's, and you got, if you just think about it, it couldn't have went in this part of his hand because that would have been easy to tear. So if you study it, you'll see where they really pierced him at was right up in this area right here. So can you, you see Jesus? He's on the cross. And you got railroad spikes going through each one of your wrists right here as you're stretched out. And now uh, uh, they've, they've crossed your legs over one, each other like this, and you have a railroad spike that's being put through your legs. So now you can imagine as he's on the cross, it's a little hard to breathe. So if he wants to catch a breath, he has to lift himself up. Can you imagine the pain every time? He wants to get a good breath. He's having to lift himself up against the pain, against the agony, and all that for somebody that want to throw a stone. All of that 
listen, at a chance that you might love him back. All of that at a chance that you might live for him. And he hung there. He even got thirsty one time, Cameron, and he asked him for something to drink. They brought him vinegar in a sponge. And you know, the Old Testament prophecy had to be fulfilled because the prophet Isaiah said that not one bone in his body would be broken. So in order to get them to recognize whether he was dead or not, one of the soldiers, they came with a spear and they stuck it through his side. It says that it came up and it pierced his sacred heart. And it says that once they pulled the sword back out, out came blood and water. What happens after death? Blood and the water in the body, they, they separate one from another. So he's already dead. So the prophet was right when he said that not one bone in his body would be broken. But the blessedness is not in that he gave his life for us, but that he rose again with all power in his hand. He rose again, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God, making intercession on our behalf. And in the shedding of his blood, according to the book of Acts, he purchased the church with his own blood. My brother and sister, you don't have to look far. It's all in the word of God. Whatever you're seeking is in his word. Salvation can be found only in Jesus Christ. can be found nowhere else. Salvation is only in Christ. He knew that we were in need of salvation, so that is why he died. He purchased the church with his own blood. So now whoever you are, red, yellow, black, or white, male, female, wherever you come from, whosoever will, you can come. You can come to Jesus. I'm glad that he came because he made a way for us to have access to him. You know, at one time, we was cut off from this. We was cut off. So he had to come and make a way for us to have access. And now we do. We can come to Jesus. You come out here in this word. What is his word? The gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So then faith come by hearing. Hearing, after the, hearing by the word of God. After hearing, you must believe the same. After belief, you repent of your sins, which is a change in your mind that produces a change in your action. After repentance, you confess with your mouth the sweetest name known to mortal tongue, and that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And after confession, you are willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come, and the Lord himself will add you to his body. And after that, you remain faithful unto death. And you'll receive a crown of life that would never fade away. Maybe you are here today and maybe you're watching and, and you're already a Christian, but you just say, hey, man, I am standing in the need of prayer. We all stand in the need of prayer. Amen. Never get to a point where you're too proud to ask for prayer. Amen. Because the Bible is right where it says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail with much. So my brother, my sister, my friend, you have this opportunity. You have this grand occasion, this chance that has been given to you today. Don't put off today for what you make plans on doing tomorrow. The only thing that is sure is right now, what are you going to do with this time? And together we stand and sing the song of invitation.